Welcome to Module 1 of the Molly GPU Training, Mobile GPU Essentials. In this introductory course, we will explore mobile GPUs, taking a look at what they are used for and the systems in which they operate. The first graphics use case that most people think of is 3D gaming, with its high-quality real-time rendering of three-dimensional environments. Recent years have seen a surge in high-end 3D gaming on mobile, with hugely popular titles such as Fortnite and PUBG making the leap from PC and console platforms, as well as many mobile-first titles such as Honor of Kings. In 2018, mobile gaming had total revenues of approximately $70 billion, accounting for just over half the total worldwide gaming market. While 3D gaming steals much of the limelight, 2D gaming actually has the largest share of the mobile market. At the time of publishing this video, 75 of the top 100 titles in the Google Play Store use 2D graphics. However, these games still use underlying 3D APIs to render and will still be GPU accelerated. What may be less well known is that mobile GPUs are used to accelerate nearly all the rendering on a device. The 3D APIs have become the means to accelerate the user interface rendering. Here, they can be used directly or as a backend to higher level APIs such as the Skia 2D library or a web browser. Molly is widely deployed into both mobile devices and smart televisions. These devices require the GPU to efficiently interact with the high resolution camera and video streams. This data is stored in a YUV color, not the traditional RGB color that the graphics APIs would normally use. Direct zero copy access to YUV data by the GPU ensures low power rendering. Modern GPUs are really general purpose data plane processors. They are highly efficient at processing large data parallel algorithms, so they often find use outside of traditional rendering use cases. There are many such use cases, but one of the most common is computer vision, which is widely gaining traction for augmented reality use cases. These algorithms use the GPU to process incoming imagery, but rather than producing a picture, they output semantic information about the scene, for example, the location and identity of an object found in the image. Neural networks are a common machine learning technique used to drive the back end of modern data analysis processing, including computer vision. Neural networks are another data parallel problem which can be processed efficiently by a GPU, although this will not be as efficient as using a dedicated accelerator such as an ARM Ethos NPU. As interesting as these general purpose GPU cases are, for this series we'll be focusing solely on the rendering aspects of the graphics APIs. The mobile rendering pipeline consists of three processors. The CPU runs the application and the graphics driver. The GPU handles the rendering of the graphics workloads. The display processor handles getting the completed frames out onto the screen. The CPU controls the process. To set up the rendering workloads, it must provide the GPU with two types of input. Resources are the data which are needed to render the scene. Meshes, textures, shader programs, and so on. Commands are the operations the applications ask the GPU to perform, each command processing using previously created resources. Once the GPU has finished processing, it emits a completed frame or window surface, which can be handed off to the DPU for presentation to the user. While this pipeline is functional, it would result in some pretty boring output frames. To make more interesting rendering algorithms, it is possible for the GPU to modify the content of its own resources, which can then be consumed by later rendering operations. With more recent APIs, it is even possible for the GPU to have some control over the rendering command sequence, with indirect draw calls issued by the application providing a template with a few blanks that the GPU itself is responsible for filling in. Let's take a look at the system environment that the mobile rendering pipeline operates in. This is a typical gaming desktop. It has a discrete CPU, GPU, and DRAM, with a power budget for these being between 225 and 370 watts for a mid-end machine. All of this input power will eventually come out of the system in the form of heat. To sustainably draw this much power, the system relies on a significant amount of active cooling. Multiple fans drive over 100 cubic feet per minute of airflow over large heat sinks, allowing it to dissipate the generated thermal waste. By contrast, this is a typical mobile system. It uses a system on chip, with the CPU, GPU, and their supporting components on a single silicon die. The DRAM is a separate piece of silicon, as it uses a different manufacturing process, but is typically stacked on top of the main logic die in an arrangement called package on package. For a smartphone, the total sustainable power budget for the main SOC and its DRAM is somewhere between 2 and 3 watts, depending on device and environment factors. This number is so small because these systems rely exclusively on passive cooling. There are no fans and no high area heat sinks to effectively convect waste heat away. 
To make matters worse, phones are often designed with plastic glass cases, neither of which are well known for their thermal conductivity. Users will also often use an aftermarket outer case to protect their device from knocks and bumps. This makes for a challenging thermal environment, so making gaming content use the system as efficiently as possible is critical for achieving sustainable high-end mobile graphics. You may have trouble visualizing what 2 to 3 watts looks like. This is the most energy efficient light bulb in my house, a 470 lumen LED bulb, equivalent to a 40 watt old school incandescent, so it's not particularly bright. This uses 6 watts. For mobile graphics, we're effectively running an entire gaming computer for less than half the power of an energy saving light bulb. These components are the heart of the system that is being used for every graphical application. We'll come back to the GPU in more detail later in this series, but it's useful to quickly review the other parts that will be needed. In most systems, there will be multiple types of CPU, using the ARM Dynamic or Big Little Technologies. The big CPUs are physically larger and provide the highest single thread performance. The little CPUs are significantly smaller, so are therefore usually more numerous. They are more energy efficient, but with lower peak single thread performance. In the latest systems, it's not uncommon to also find some middle sized cores which sit between these two. Based on the workload demanded, the host operating system scheduler will dynamically migrate application threads to the most efficient processor available in the system, aiming to give the required performance at the best energy efficiency possible. DRAM is used to store the code and the data for running programs. Mobile systems have a unified memory pool that is shared by all of the components. This is unlike discrete graphics cards in the desktop space, which will have dedicated graphics RAM, commonly called VRAM. The most important thing to know about DRAM is that accessing it is very energy intensive. Including the system on chip and DRAM cost, a convenient rule of thumb for all in power costs of a memory access is 100 milliwatts per gigabyte per second. So, if you allocate a quarter of a 2 watt power budget to DRAM access, you only get 5 gigabytes per second to play with. This might sound like a lot, but at 60 frames per second, it's only 85 megabytes per frame, and this has to cover all the CPU, GPU, and DPU memory accesses. A modern DPU is a complex processor in its own right, capable of handling many forms of layered composition, as well as scaling, rotation, and color conversion of the component layers. The DPU is a real-time processor with strict display scan-out timing deadlines to meet. A composition task that is too complex for the DPU to handle may fall back to using the GPU. It is used to simplify the workload into something the DPU can handle natively. As we will see in a later module in this series, there are some areas of the rendering pipeline where we can set things up during the rendering to make the DPU's life easier and avoid these GPU fallback paths. Alongside the main processors, a smartphone will include a wide variety of domain-specific processors and accelerators. These include, for example, the modem for cellular voice and data, the video processors for video compression and decompression, an image signal processor to handle incoming camera images, and increasingly, a machine learning accelerator. All of these components share the same 2 to 3 watt power budget, an online augmented reality game that is making heavy use of live video feeds from the device's camera, GPS location tracking for the user positioning, and mobile data for communication with the game servers will have a measurably reduced power budget for the application software and rendering. This graph shows the most important relationships to be aware of when optimizing an application running on a mobile system. It shows the power consumption of a single processor, in this case a stereotypical big CPU, at different performance points. Different CPUs, and the silicon implementations of them from our partners, will each have a different power curve, depending on the trade-offs used when building them. However, the general shape of the power curves will be the same. The key point to note is that the relationship between performance and power isn't linear. More and more power is needed to achieve each performance increment. This is caused by the voltage increase that is needed to achieve higher clock frequencies. Transistor energy per operation is proportional to voltage squared. Each silicon process is designed around a specific operating voltage, the nominal voltage. It is considered the reference top frequency. Frequency points above this are considered overdrive or overclock frequencies, and frequency points below this are considered underdrive or underclock frequencies. Given we have a system-wide power budget, the energy spent in one area cannot be spent elsewhere without overheating the device. An application can choose to shift the power balance around, for example, increasing the overall power available to drive the GPU performance by choosing to reduce the CPU and DRAM usage. This figure illustrates one possible distribution of 2.5 watts across the components in the system. 
I've ignored the DPU itself, as it normally is only a minor consumer of energy, but its memory traffic should be considered in the overall DRAM budget. What is most interesting in this diagram is we've chosen to assign only 750 milliwatts to the CPUs. Looking at the graph in the previous slide, we can see that this is only enough to run our single stereotype big CPU core at its nominal operating point. Why then are mobile systems shipping with up to 8 processors if we are unable to use them? To answer this question, let's go back to the data from our power curve, but plot it as a performance per watt score to make it clearer what is happening. At the nominal operating point for this processor, we get a single thread performance score of 14 points, but only manage to get a score of 18 points per watt. If we have the frequency, running the CPU at an underclock frequency and voltage, we only get a score of 7 points. However, we increase the efficiency score up to 35 points per watt. If it is possible to split the workload across two parallel threads, we can recover the overall performance of 14 points, but do so while consuming only half the power. The key lesson here is that large multiprocessor clusters in mobile systems, be they CPU or GPU, are designed to allow high energy efficiency by multi-threading complex workloads across multiple cores. The presence of a lot of CPU cores allows for even more complex applications to run processors at underdrive voltages, gaining that critical V squared energy savings if they can be partitioned effectively across multiple threads. This leads to one of my favorite quotes from Peter Drucker's book, The Effective Executive. He was a management consultant, and one of his observations visiting companies is that they often focus too much on efficiency. Fine-tuning their existing methods of working missed larger opportunities, what he called effectiveness. That could be achieved by drastically changing how they work. This has many parallels in the world of software and graphics optimization. A more effective algorithm is often able to give far more performance than efficient implementation of a poor one. The next video in this series will explore the rendering pipeline used by OpenGL ES and Vulkan Graphics APIs, and the role that each pipeline stage plays.